When most people think of King Arthur, they usually picture him on horseback brandishing a sword Excalibur. This is actually what a medieval knight would look like around the 15th century. Through the years, the legend expanded as medieval writers all over Europe added to the story. Arthur's popularity and momentum continued to grow as themes, plots, and characters were adapted to be more contemporaneous with the changing times. But the Arthurian legend as we know it actually begins a thousand years earlier in 5th or 6th century Britain, not as an English king, but a British battle commander, leading the former Romano-Britons against the invading hordes of the Germanic Anglo-Saxons. Before you can determine whether this Arthur really existed, you really need to ask if this historical context is real. The written sources for this period are scarce, vague, and unreliable. They come most notably from the British scribe Gildas, the English monk Bede, and the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It's their work that led to the traditional historical narrative of the Anglo-Saxon invasion that eventually transformed Britain into England, land of the Angles. By the beginning of the 5th century AD, and after more than 350 years under Roman rule, the fading Western Roman Empire withdrew from Britain to deal with its own issues. The Britons, seemingly defenseless, were mercilessly raided by the Picts and the Scotti. The British leader Vortigern hired Anglo-Saxon mercenaries led by Hengist and Horsa to fight them off. They hopped on their boats, came to Britain, and stopped the raids. They wanted more than the British land granted to them by Vortigern and switched from mercenary ally to conqueror. Rallying under another leader, Ambrosius Aurelianus, the Britons managed to fight back against the Anglo-Saxons. Decades of fighting ensued, with victories and defeats on both sides, culminating in a decisive British victory at Mount Baden, sometime around 500 AD. The Britons enjoyed a temporary period of peace, but the Anglo-Saxon invasion would continue, setting towns ablaze, killing, enslaving, and displacing the British inhabitants. But where's Arthur in all of this? Gildas appears to have an aversion to names, giving us only Ambrosius earlier on, but not the leader at Baden decades later. It's Bede who names Vortigern, Hengist, and Horsa, but their historicity is also in doubt. Not one of them mentions Arthur. The earliest reference to Arthur is debatably from the 7th century Welsh poem Ye Gododhan, though it's only a brief one-line comparison to another legendary warrior. It wasn't until the 9th century when Arthur first gets placed in the middle of this conflict in the Welsh pseudo-historical text History of the Britons, possibly written by Nennius. In this text, he's a battle commander, not king, leading the Britons to victory in 12 battles. Arthur is also included in the Arnold's Cambriae, a chronicle with a list of years and their corresponding memorable events. The Annals has Arthur fighting in the early 6th century at Baden and his last battle at Camlin, but it was written hundreds of years later in the 10th century. The Arthurian legend's meteoric rise to popularity didn't really take off until Geoffrey of Monmouth included the first cradle-to-grave story of Arthur in another pseudo-historical text, The History of the Kings of Britain in the 1130s. Gildas is the only somewhat contemporary figure writing about this conflict, debatably around the year 540 AD. Almost 200 years later in 731, we get Bede's account, followed by the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle, which started in the 880s. For the events of the 5th and 6th century, the Chronicle got their information from Bede, and Bede got his from Gildas. So we really only have one source, Gildas. But how reliable is he? At this time, scribes weren't writing history as historians do today factual dates, events, and people as unbiasedly considered as possible. Instead, history was much more of a morality tale or politically motivated, altering facts to fit their purpose. It gets worse with Nennius and Geoffrey, who are difficult to mine for facts as they dabble in outright fantasy and fiction. With Gildas, his 5th century history was only a small portion of his text. Most of On the Ruin is a sermon, blaming the Anglo-Saxon invasion on the sins of the British. For a long time, their version of events was accepted, more or less, as actual history. The archaeological remains we did find in Britain from this period were previously interpreted and identified based on this historical account from Gildas, Bede, and the Chronicle. But by the 1980s, the evidence was being reconsidered more critically and independently. At first, it seemed that archaeology confirmed the carnage wrought by the supposed flood of genocidal Anglo-Saxon invaders. But the evidence of death and destruction at towns and villas may not have been the result of violence. Instead, Britain may have undergone a cultural and political shift before the supposed Anglo-Saxon invasion, abandoning Roman economy, towns and villas for hill forts, timber buildings, and a barter-based economy. 
There is even evidence in some areas of continued Roman-style occupation as late as the 7th century. So the destruction we do see could be explained by mundane accidental fire damage, deterioration from abandonment, and plain old burials, not the victims of a mass killing spree. DNA studies have demonstrated a genetic relationship of modern British people to northern Germanic people. But how much of this relationship is due to the movement of people like the Germanic tribes throughout history, especially during the long reign of the vast Roman Empire? Germans were already in Britain long before the Anglo-Saxon migration, having served and lived there as part of the Roman army. Where DNA is used to support a large migration, the time scale is said to be over 300 years. Instead of a flood of incoming Anglo-Saxons in a shorter period of time, it could have been a slow, centuries-long trickle. Regardless, DNA isn't the only signifier for ethnic identity. To some extent, it's a cultural choice. My grandparents immigrated to Canada from Italy in the 1950s, and while my parents may still identify partially as Italian, I just think of myself as Canadian, or more specifically, Torontonian. A future archaeologist wouldn't be able to guess my Italian heritage by my possessions or diet alone, nor would they be right by categorizing me and my cultural identity as Italian judging only by my DNA. It's possible that some Germanic and British people made similar choices on their own cultural identity on an individual basis. What was once thought to be the remains of an Anglo-Saxon, Jute, or Frisian based on the material possessions they were buried with could have been genetically British, who chose to identify with their material culture and adopted their burial customs as well. But there still was a migration, to some extent, as the DNA suggests. After all, English is a Germanic language. There was still some violence, as indicated in the more historically attested 7th century. But it's not all of Britain on one side, defending against the Anglo-Saxon horde on the other. Instead, you see Britons fighting Britons, English fighting English, and allied British-English fighting other British-English alliances. Gildas never meant for his brief overview of this one 5th century Saxon conflict to be a factually accurate historical account. Adding to this, his Latin is often confusing, vague, and easily misinterpreted, especially by Bede, who made it the Adventus Saxonum, the coming of the Saxons. Nennius didn't help matters with his pseudo-history. There's no convincing evidence that any of the 12 battles he has Arthur leading ever existed, except for maybe Baden, which he likely got from Gildas anyways. The history of the Britons was a Welsh text from the 9th century. It was a time when the Welsh were victims of several English attacks. You can see now that Arthur's historical context is doubtful, with much of the detail largely fictitious. Nennius may have known of a folk hero named Arthur and inserted him into the already overblown account of the Anglo-Saxon conflict. He made him the heroic British battle commander, whose nobility and prowess Britons could draw inspiration from in their current fight with the English. While there are several archaeological sites that date to Arthur's time, only Glastonbury connects to him directly. In 1191, monks from the abbey claimed to have found the remains of two people and a lead cross that identified them as King Arthur and Guinevere, and Glastonbury as the Isle of Avalon. Both the cross and bones have been missing for centuries. It was likely a hoax to attract attention and money for repairs to the fire-damaged abbey. While not an island in the 12th century, Glastonbury Tor was surrounded by marshland at some point in the distant past. Arthur's connection with Avalon first appears in Geoffrey of Monmouth's history, where the fatally wounded Arthur is brought to Avalon in hopes of recovery, but his fate is left in doubt. So the burial could have also been an attempt to demoralize the Welsh opponents of the King of England, Henry II. The Welsh still saw Arthur as their king, so this burial would prove that Arthur was indeed mortal and never coming back. The fact that Gildas, the closest relevant contemporary source for Arthur, never mentions him by name is reason enough to doubt that he was real. Perhaps the legend derived from Ambrosius, who Gildas does name, though they often appear as separate characters in the legend. Archaeology provides no definitive evidence to support Arthur's existence either, but that has by no means prevented the hunt for a real historical King Arthur. There are a few Arthurs around the end of the 6th century, most notably Artuir Mac Aidan, son of King Aidan Mac Gabroin of Dalriada, a region now part of Scotland and Ireland. Artuir was never king, his brother succeeded their father and died fighting in a battle against the Picts. But we know very little about him. Outside of his name and that he actually existed, there's no evidence that can securely connect him to the legendary Arthur. 
The Roman Lucius Artorius Castus has been put forward as the source or inspiration for King Arthur. This theory states that he was active around the late 2nd or early 3rd century AD, hundreds of years before the supposed Anglo-Saxon invasion. He held a military post in Britain, commanding a heavy Sarmatian cavalry unit, being both the source for the portrayal of Arthur and his men fighting on horseback, and the sword and the stone tail inspired by their mythology. He also led another unit called the Britannicae against the British settlement in Amorica in Gaul, now part of France. Artorius was real. There are fragments of an inscribed summary of his career on his stone sarcophagus. It doesn't quite tell the same story though. First off, the sarcophagus is in Croatia. His posting in Britain was at the end of his career and was likely administrative only. The Britannicae unit was once in Britain where it got its name, but by the first century had been stationed in modern day Hungary. As for the heavy Sarmatian cavalry, some were part of the Roman army in Britain, but there is no actual evidence in the inscription or elsewhere that has Artorius leading them. His campaign in Armorica was most likely in Armenia at the eastern border of the empire, due to a probable misreading of the partial inscription on his sarcophagus. Armorica was relevant to begin with as it was used to connect Artorius to Arthur's campaign in Gaul and Geoffrey of Monmouth's story. That same Gallic campaign has also been used to draw parallels to the historical British leader Riothamus. Around the 470s, Riothamus brought an army with him from Britain in an alliance with Rome to prevent the Visigoths from annexing Roman territory in Gaul. Riothamus was defeated by the Visigoths and the survivors fled to Burgundy. Arthur, in Geoffrey's story, is not fighting with Rome, but against them. Arthur's Roman conquering spree is cut short when he heads back home to deal with his treacherous nephew Mordred. Arthur kills Mordred, but is fatally wounded. He's carried off to the Isle of Avalon, and his story ends. How do you get Arthur from Riothamus? It's been argued that Riothamus is a title, meaning Great King, which is an apt description of Arthur. But versions of Riothamus have been identified as actual names, not just a title. Also, Riothamus is last heard from in Burgundy. There is an Avalon in Burgundy, but it's about 200 kilometers from where Riothamus was actually last heard from. Regardless, Avalon isn't first associated with Arthur until Geoffrey of Monmouth, writing 700 years later. All these theories rely upon the vague, untrustworthy, non-contemporary, and pseudo-historical texts already mentioned and more. Later sources could have drawn from contemporary folk and oral traditions, but this only hints at some possible element of truth as oral traditions changed through the centuries before finally being written down. So, was King Arthur real? There may have been a warrior of some repute named Arthur at one point in British history, but that's all we can say with the available evidence. In the unlikely event that some definitive archaeological or trustworthy written source is uncovered, we may never be able to confirm the details of the legend with any more certainty. This video barely scratches the surface of the Anglo-Saxon migration and the numerous King Arthur theories, so let's continue the discussion in the comments below. Please like, subscribe, and if you're able, support the channel on Patreon.